Good morning, Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> I feel very privileged to be invited and also to be here with you because I know many of you and I know your deep understanding of things Irish and things international, things Chinese and your dedication to doing something more, something better for this country. And uh, so uh, I hope that uh, what I offer you will justify your using your lunch and <laughs> coming out from here for this purpose. But uh, <clears throat> let's see how it goes. Plenty of time for questions, hopefully. Um, <clears throat> excuse me while I turn back to see what, what was on that slide. Um, <clears throat> basically, nomology is the thing that I do. And uh, uh, so, <clears throat> nomos is objective, as in economics and ology, subjective, as in psychology. And from a decision-making or decision-structuring point of view, people in the West tend to just live in these subjective structures and ignore the objective. And people in the East tend to live in the objective ones and ignore the subjective. But when you've got something as complicated as intercultural relationships, you need both, especially when you want to do business, which in a way, as a very objective content, you need both, the objective and the subjective. And uh, <clears throat> the idea is that there is a common structure to both together, that it makes it easier to make sense of what you're trying to do, or in this case, trying to understand how we could do business with China. Uh, <clears throat> so. Towards the end, and maybe in the questions, I'll refer to some of the successes and failures. And we see we've got uh, um, <coughs> Jerry Bean here, uh, um, <coughs> who, as mayor of Dublin, uh, was part of one of our great successes to build a twinning relationship. Uh, <coughs> we've got uh, Li Ming Wang can't be here, he's in China at the moment, which is a co author on this book. Uh, <coughs> and for years, we worked on the idea of our Ireland China Task Force, and it came to nothing. Um, we have Leo Corcoran in the back. Uh, um, <coughs> the idea of a, a farmer bridge, we can talk about that later. Uh, Shanghai Expo, we, again, we'll leave till later. And um, Limerick Shannon China Business Foundation, we spent two or three years trying to build that, and it got blocked as well. Another reason <coughs> we'll like to talk about later. And uh, um, <coughs> Shannon become a deep sea transship in port. Joe Gorman is here. We can talk about that as well. And the most recent project, which is just last week, where we had a vice governor of Shaanxi province here on my invitation, 37 million, a vice governor, that's like the tarnished, eh? um, <clears throat> now, a sign that they want to build friendships with us, that they would actually come this far, you know, because of my invitation uh, as part of something else. But uh, so. N- this is the strength of their desire to build relationships with us. Um, <clears throat> the nomology thing, um, <clears throat> and I've discussed it often with people in China, and I work every week with a Professor Rong Du, uh, it's the idea of bones, flesh and skin. The bones are the decision structures, they're the same whether it's China, Africa, English language, whatever, same bones, but different skin, so we look very different. But underneath, if you can get to the common bones, then you can see the the the, the, uh, the similarities. And <clears throat> most of my research over the last few years has been about nomology. And one of the things that it has discovered is that there are three forms of uh, research or knowledge, if you like. Science and humanities are the two that are established in the universities, but practice is not. What I do is essentially practice. Now, it has to be good scientifically and good in the humanities, but if it doesn't work in practice, I don't care, and I'm not interested. But it is actually, a, it's, it's rooted in that area. Um, <clears throat> the interesting thing is that what I've been working on, these structures, isn't new. Actually, Aristotle wrote two books about analytics. It's a long time ago. He's the one who first came up with the idea that there are regularities in how people think. And he defined the subjective ones and the objective ones as being different. And he wrote books on economics and psychology and stuff like that. And he was a scientist. Kant more recently continued it in philosophy, which is essentially the humanities, so it's very much into the cultural area. And he 
It's discovered that this subjective one's divided into two. I commit myself to something. Or I am convinced, or not convinced, that this makes sense. These two. And so that was as far as it went. From my point of view, I got lucky because there are now thousands of management cases, tens of thousands of people using systems, and they're all accessible over the internet, so you can fill out the jigsaw. So I got the easy piece to actually fill out the jigsaw. And what you're going to see today is the jigsaw and trying to use it as a base for the relationship building with China. Um, So, tested in China since the late 90s, the idea that you can have a generic structure, the bones of decision making, well, it's a scientific sort of hypothesis. Good science, you don't test using the data that you develop the model. You have to use different data. So what's different data? Because we're using every management system you could get in the West. You have to go to a place that is not derived from the West. So China was, it seemed like a good idea. So I've been going there since then. Now, what came out of that, which is very nice, is <clears throat> things like this. That when you have a template which is generic, you can look at the Chinese version of it and the Western version of it, and the little differences between them suddenly pop out. And they don't matter unless you want to do business. If you want to do business, you're right up and you're confused, what's happening here? Because I know I could get the deal, or I know I could lose the deal, but I don't know what's going on here. If the little nuances make a huge difference when you're up front. Uh, I can see Frank Hartley, who has done business very successfully in China, is there at the back, and you will talk later, I hope. Um, so, it's templates for understanding. From that, you can build models, and I would have built this model in 1999, I think it was. And having discovered three main areas from Aristotle and Kant, the committing, I'm committed myself, so Western religions very much following a leader, you know, whether it's Islam or Jewish or Christianity, you follow somebody, you're committed to that person. And then on the left, the Chinese one, uh, it's a village society, you marry into the village and they've been in that village for two, three, four thousand years and so on, and you adjust to whatever it is required of you in that village because you've moved, you know, a hundred miles or ten thousand miles. And then you haven't seen various different versions of it the classic oriental, constantly adjusting, the classic uh, occidental, I'm committed to whatever I want and I don't care what you're going to do, I'm doing what I want. That's one version. Um, Another version, just trying to show it symbolically, so the depth of it, the depth of your commitment to something, if you've no commitment to something, it doesn't really matter, but if you have a huge commitment, maybe that's important. But then the convincing one, so the model of a person, Okay, so you've got yourself, you've got others, you've got world. Or, as in theory, science, humanities, practice. And then you've got the adjusting, which is like your relationship, it's like a bicycle. You know, how do you know that you're going to get from here to there if the bicycle keeps falling over? You have to find your balance all the time. So it's all about balancing and yin and yang, many different versions. Um, Basically, I'll show you three structures today. Uh, the first two on the left, you're going to spend some time on them, and the one on the right is a combination. And what you see here is based on just two yin and yangs, two dimensions. Subjective, objective, which is uh, top and bottom, and self and others, left and right. Now, the idea is that these are generic structures, so therefore they can be usable as templates to look at anything. In this case, it is to look at the differences between peoples generally throughout the world. And so, here we see the United States more into committing themselves. You know, what do I want for the United States and, you know, the flag and importance and so on? Uh, Europe, much more, does this make sense? More extroverted. Is this a good, sensible solution? China, much more... Uh, adjusting but relating to others, the family, the group and so on, society. Japan adjusting self. Am I behaving in a correct way? So these differences are not great but they're very big when you're up close. 
and you're trying to understand what's going on. Now, <clears throat> recently, China has been trying to westernize, which is a bit difficult because a lot of the western systems are not really very good, so they're trying to copy western systems. So China would have started off with what they would call uh, wuli systems, and then uh, <coughs> the time of uh, Mao was in decline and Deng Xiaoping came out with a new idea. He said, I'm not entirely convinced by what the chairman said. Now everybody said, God, that's the most dangerous thing you could say. How long is he going to last? That was the idea of convincing. He's the one who brought in Xi Li, the idea of convincing that you should have open discussion. Subsequently, the idea that you, you have to be committed to a project and to the people involved in a project. That, that's, that's more recent and um, so that's a, a, a recent system which I've been working with to an extent since the, the late 90s. Um, others have looked at this template without actually knowing the structure where it comes from. And they would say the, the US more focused on the interior, Japan more on the exterior, Europe more qualitative issues, China more quantitative issues. And if any of you are doing business with China and you're doing presentations with them, you're going to find your head wrecked by the number of numbers that the Chinese delegation will present. We're this big, we've got that many people, and so on. Whereas the qualitative of the Europeans will say, well, we're thinking of changing and going from this focus to this focus, and so on. Um, it's a template difference, but you must appreciate where they're coming from. Um, another and there are many theories out there, cultural theory, a grid and group theory, uh, <clears throat> which, as I said, are, are they're there without explaining the structure that they come from. Uh, <clears throat> group, weak or strong on group. US and Japan, very individualistic. Europe and China, very much group, very much into others. Um, we would have the view the general view from childhood, east-west, that's the big difference. And really, I can't understand those people, whatever. Actually, if you come down to the next one, uh, how many people here really understand the mentality of the United States? Actually, there's a similar difference. In, it's very hard for Chinese people to understand Japanese people, am I right? <laughs> it's a difficulty. Um, whereas there is a possibility of a bonding between Europe and China because we're both into other people, into relationships. Um, so <clears throat> the grid idea up here is very much into you're committing some, to something, you're convinced about something, so it's weak on grid. Strong on grid is it's all this highly interactive stuff, and that's really what you have to understand uh, if we're going to move from the more Western approach and then weak and strong on, on group. Um, <clears throat> other versions of this that have come out of the same thing, the, the US, much more pioneer, individualist, Europe, more egalitarian, China, more bureaucratic, uh, and uh, Japan, more fatalist. So to understand that, if you're going to do business in China, you have to understand that there's a lot of bureaucracy, there is a lot of hierarchy. That's the way they work. Um, <clears throat> uh, from a subjective point of view, which is what we're more comfortable with, you can use the subjective structure for uh, comparing uh, us with China. Europe, China, US. And it's sometimes easier to start with the convincing one because we're, we're more... more attuned to that in Europe. Self, others, world. If you get a whole lot of, mainly Irish people in the room here, so what have we got? We've got a whole lot of individuals. Have a discussion, have a few beers, or my preference is something better than that, but uh, um, we would end up with a big discussion uh, with many different views. But a lot of Chinese people in the room, they would find who's who, and who's, what groups are there, what subgroups, who are higher than others and so on. There's a hierarchy of groups and they're all relating to each person's position and so on. When you're working with people in China, you're working with groups. And you're working with groups in a hierarchy. The US is quite different. 
it's all about success and somebody's more successful and moving somewhere else to, on to another place. It's, if you're going to try and work in relationship with these, you really have to understand where they're coming from. So China, much more into the need for political stability. That is absolutely paramount in China. Then after that, cultural, after that, religious. It seems for a communist country, they're actually, in my experience, extremely religious. More religious than us who are sort of post-religious. We're kind of religious structures, but they, so much about their ancestors and, and the, the people who, who died and so on. We're much more into self, physical, emotional, artistic. You know, very artistic, but we're more artistic than uh, they would be in China. Uh, we're not as obsessed with our needs. China's needs are huge. They, 1.2, 1.3 billion people. In the last 20 years, they've taken 400 billion out of poverty. You know, they are relating to those needs, and you have to see it not in terms of oh, threatening America as being the, the biggest in the world. Look at it at the success divided by 1.2 billion people. You know, it's just, uh, they're making significant improvements, but starting per individual from a low base. They're, this is what they want to do and they need political security for this and we can come back to that again <coughs> later because there are all these issues about uh, human rights and all that sort of thing that, that people like to talk about. Um, so we're more into the, the feelings area and uh, <coughs> so being more individualistic, our issue is emotional. Do I feel like these people? Can I trust these people? And they're actually saying, do they recognise us? Do they recognise uh, uh, our right to exist, to trade, whatever it is? The point that I see the coming together of these two is in the area of friendship. Recently, with a delegation just last week, the vice uh, governor of Shanxi Province and his people, and the, the key issue was, can we have friendship? And that was agreed by the end of the thing. Yes, friendship is the thing we agree on. So. It's a bridge, and what I'm suggesting is that this is the bridge that we can use. Um, so, the third model, you've seen the combination of the two, uh, you've seen the subjective one, this is the objective one, and it's the one that is in, in, in the East. Planning versus putting. What are you doing? Are you uncertain? So the question is, are you in harmony? Maybe uh, you're, 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 you're pretty certain about things. There is a disagreement. Uh, place versus people. Um, I'm going to be suggesting two things today. One is that we should be more concerned with this objective model. And the other is that within that, there is this issue about place versus people. And that uh, in China, they're more concerned with people and people relationships and we, in our own institutions, are too concerned with place and with structures and this body and that department and all that sort of thing. But there is an interesting background to all of this, which, and we've been studying it and we're going to work on it in the second book, which is the Irish culture and the Chinese culture didn't go through the Industrial Revolution and the Banking Revolution. So they went straight from a rural economy to a high-tech service economy. So what is the difference? Banking revolution, industrial revolution was all about property and ownership. We don't mediate those, we go straight. So therefore, we're much more people oriented, both in the Irish culture and the Chinese culture, the traditional Irish culture. So the words that don't translate well into English, guanxi, indirect action, personal relationships through people. It's, and you kind of say that, yeah, it's very uncomfortable. In Irish, it's kadrif. Guanxi is a huge word, it's a word that would fill this room. So is kadrif. Because the question you want to know about, well, what kind of kadrif? Is it economic? Is it political? Is it sexual? Is it friendship? What is it? It's a huge word. The other one is, <coughs> Uh, and that's really and, and how is why is Guanxi important? They're very hierarchical. But if you want to, if your if your aunt needs an operation, 
And the queue in the hospital is six months, eight months. The next thing you'll say, is there anybody around? Oh, yeah, my cousin actually works as a nurse in the hospital. On to the cousin. Any chance that you could get my aunt in? Oh, well, I'll ask somebody because I know somebody who's a doctor there. Now, this is very Irish, but it's very Chinese. It is relationships to compensate for the fact that you don't have control. Now, the other one is <coughs> this is about the relationships, but the other one is Mianzi, which is translated by Chinese people who are good at English into face. So, and that, well, you wonder what does it mean? Well, not to lose face in a relationship doesn't mean a huge amount. We tried Eva in Irish, you know, we say I, but it's not I. We try Eva, which is your image. But actually, there is another word which is deeper than that, which is Inuk, which is an old Irish word which only appears in modern Irish as Lahanuk, half page. It's a half face. In other words, your story, your, it's your image, who you are, your character, your personality. I mean, there are a lot of controversies about China and Chinese people, uh, and they say maybe they're unethical. What's the first thing that Chinese people do when they go into a group of other Chinese people? To find out who are the unethical people here that we can't trust, and then work with the people who are ethical. So actually, ethics are really important in China. It is knowing. So how do you find that out? You find out by Mianzi. Now, when you're dealing with an issue to implement it, if they have uh, uh, problems with payment and stuff like that, okay, then you don't, you don't lose face. But when you're building a relationship, you actually, in a Chinese culture, you would show what your strength is, what your wealth is, you know, what your achievements are. You want to build image. So, <clears throat> now let's compare typical Western approach to building a business. Typical especially the United States one, is we propose something and then we develop the perception. Have I got the capacity to build a new factory? Uh, can I collaborate? Uh, have they the capability to work with me? Can I cooperate? That's your typical Western approach. The typical Chinese approach is the opposite. Um, <clears throat> do I want to cooperate with these people? Uh, um, <clears throat> What's the perception of it? Could I cooperate with them? Maybe I'm not sure. Maybe we'll go out for another meal tonight. Maybe we'll see after a few sessions of uh, Thai and a few uh, sessions in uh, uh, karaoke and so on. You know, what's really, what are they really like? You know, can, can I relate to them? And then maybe build questions of capability. Have I got the capability to work with them and they with, with me? and then go on that way. So, very opposite. After that, both sides to an extent implement. You know, there is an issue though, because China is much more into hierarchy and into harmony, they really want things to be very secure up here. But everything is balanced. They don't like being down here, they don't like confrontation. So there's an issue. There could be a problem, but they're not going to confront because they lost the face, and then they'll go into conflict, and you have to be able to manage conflict in a, in a relationship with China, because there will be conflict. Their conflict is not unlike our political conflict, which is basically, okay, guns out, this is at the end of it. No, you have conflict, and then you deal with it, and you move on. Um, <clears throat> Part of the study was to see, well, does this make sense in Chinese culture? And so I've looked at various different uh, documents, and this one is from <coughs> uh, Buddha. And he talked about right understanding, and after that right speech, and right thought, then right speech, then right action. It's using the same structure. Right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. But notice in here the little structures which are used in China is called the Bagua. It's a yin yang, two by two by two. So these three open sticks, they reflect being open in terms of planning, open in terms of people, and open in terms of taking a more personal approach. Actually, it's policy making. Policy making comes first. So when I move from practice of politics into policy making, 
I was making a bigger move than I, than I, had, than I realized. And they work from here onwards. That doesn't mean it's the only way they work. Here is another one from Confucius. And actually, it looks like the Western approach of going this way, except it's doing it in a sort of an adapting way. To manifest your bright virtue, you should first govern your own states well. How can you look after your own place? And then before that, you should harmonize your clan. Before that, you should cultivate, cultivate yourselves. Before that, correct your minds. Before that, make your will sincere. Before that, extend knowledge. Before that, investigate things. So these are teachings that are in the Chinese culture. Um, back to this one. <clears throat> and this is the complicated part in a way because the two systems are embedded in each other. Um, Committing self to a project should involve convincing others that the project is going to work. And if you're building the project, there's a sense of adjusting others and saying, oh, we may have to make some changes here. And then to complete the project, there's a sense you may have to make adjustments yourself. Work harder, uh, trim your sales, whatever it is. So how does this work? Uh, that's the wrong one. There. Uh, <clears throat> The first stage of this, the subjective. No, this. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, in the first phase of this, you, it's very subjective. We survey, study, and define what we need. Commit yourself, convince others, and develop your project in the world. And we all do that. The next stage is about designing what we want, what we think will be preferred, and it's about managing the project in the world, adjusting others and adjusting self. We tend not to do that. and Towards the end of the presentation, I'm going to be focusing on that. And the, the third one is when we want to implement the whole thing, it's an adapting. So you have the project designed, but to actually get it to work, you have to be prepared to adapt the project. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Things have changed and so on. Maybe you don't have as much money or whatever it is. So let's look at that in the context of the subjective model that we already have seen. Um, and what's our, what's our problem? We've inherited a public service system. And it's not that you blame anybody for it. It's about maybe the immaturity uh, of the people in the past. But in essence, we, we essentially just look at these first three and we don't do much more. So the individual proposes what is needed, they tell the politicians and they hand it to the public service or the civil service. Um, so the sequence in which it goes, those three, what we do, but then the next thing is we should select a good solution design what might work, acquire the solution, and then construct, deliver, and maintain. What's the problem? We don't do the bottom six. If it doesn't work, we go back and we give it to the politicians and say, uh, I think there's a problem here, come up with a new manifesto, or come up with a new solution, or a, a, a revised thing, maybe set up another body another semi-state body or something like that. Um, in terms of the structure that we tend to do, the loop tends to go between the politicians and the civil service. It's not being done. Give back to the politicians. They give a new instruction and it goes around. What's the thing that is really missing? Um, okay. Uh, the part that's really missing is moving from three to four to selecting a feasible solution. Whether it is with citizens, whether, whatever it is about, or whether it is with China, it's about going into managing the world in an objective sense. Um, <clears throat> Maybe a bit of a parody, but what is the problem? Hundreds of politicians handing authority to hundreds of civil servants who then hand the authority to hundreds of semi-state bodies, who then hand it to hundreds of consulting companies, 
but then handed to hundreds of so-called experts. It's administering a system without direct relationships with people is not management. No. So, a bit hard to say, but... Let's get into this in the adjusting system to see what am I particularly talking about. Using the terms of public sector management, this is the sort of thing that, that, that we have. Uh, <coughs> officials mainly see responsibility and accountability when they're in trouble. Um, they see things as state business, whereas they should be seeing public service. Or at least it should be balanced. It's a yin and yang. But this is the part that's missing, the yang in terms of the public and the people that are involved. And that's what is being avoided. So failure to connect with citizens, but also f failure to connect with the people who could be our relationship in China. Chinese leaders who really do want relationships with us. So handing it on to the IDA and then Enterprise Ireland and then SFI, and then that does not work. Um, <clears throat> when we're doing design, the second phase, this is what we should be doing. Uh, <clears throat> who's responsible? Are they empowered? Uh, is there transparency? Uh, is there policy making? Can you encourage them? Um, when you're implementing, who is accountable? Was it enforced? Uh, have the authority to actually implement something? Was it engagement? And so on. Um, <clears throat> looking at this in more detail, and this is where the jigsaw is filled out, but it's a little bit bigger now. Each of these sections actually corresponds to committing self convincing others, which is what we tend to do, Euro Europeans, and adjusting others is what the Chinese tend to do, and adjusting self, Japan. So we're going to ignore mainly the US approach and the Japanese approach, but just compare us as Europeans versus the Chinese. And so what do we tend to do? We're we are too focused on the, our responsibilities. Who's responsible for that? Okay, they're, they're responsible, they have to do it. Um, but <clears throat> maybe there is a need for reform. Okay. But then you'll need to empower people. So what kind of empowerment is done? Set up another semi-state body, and another one, and another one. But what is missing? As I said, too much emphasis on this. What's missing is down here which is the whole area of authority. If you, for any decision, you're involving seven semi-state bodies and government departments and individuals, the authority gets lost. Who is, and there are people making decisions about things because they've been told you have to deal with it, and they're actually blocking ideas and reforms that they, sh they shouldn't be blocking, but they've been, given, they've been told to do it. So it's a, it's a missing bit. Um, <clears throat> Um, so to get from there to here it was a matter of perception how do we get a proper perception and where is the, the flaw the flaw that has come is <clears throat> why is it that things are outsour outsourced so much there is a theory which you can google NPM, New Public Management which says we don't really know how to do it uh, there should be a high trust in the market and private business methods. That sounds like a good idea. We should run our hospitals more efficiently using those. But it has been researched and it doesn't work. <coughs> Bringing accountants in to run hospitals does not work. You actually need good doctors who are empowered to, to, to run hospitals. Um, <clears throat> NPM has become an excuse not to talk to people. You say, oh, we'll hand it over to, you know, they're the consultants, they know, they know what to do. Um, now let's look at the same from the Chinese point of view. The sort of language that they talk, they're much more into people. So they're keen to cooperate, to form agreements. They want to do that. Um, they have a history of invasions by Western colonizers from 1900 and onwards. 
They want to avoid more violence against China and against Chinese people. They want to be shown respect. So, respect is important. They're open to persuasion. They want engagement. And they want reconciliation as global citizens. They want to be part of a global world. Um, The issue is, if we're living up here, and they're living down there, there's something wrong. Um, So the challenge and solution approaches. Convincing others and convincing yourselves is only good for analysing. It doesn't provide you with the design or the implementation. Um, We need to use the Chinese adjusting others lens. So to learn about China, about Chinese people and from Chinese culture. Learn how they see us and how we see them. And this is the prerequisite for building Ireland-China projects. So the next, just to show that this is possible, that this structure, this nomology actually works, here is a case of nomology done for decision making in Swahili, in Tanzania. So non-English speaking, they did it in Tanzania, in Swahili, and converted those uh, uh, words into a decision structure for five villages which had a water project. And these are people who wouldn't have had education. And they they elected five people from each village to be the leaders. And and then, this is them building it. If you were to focus in on the thing at the back, it's in Swahili. And this is them working on the project. It is possible to do transparent decision making anywhere. It's not, you're not confined to English language. And this is them doing scoring. They don't have to use Western scoring methods. They're actually working out the weights of importance of things using beads. Saying, no, I think that's more important. Move that bead there. Uh, <clears throat> Here is a case of using the, a decision making method for strategy, which uses the Bagua structure, the yin yang structure, where you ask questions what's necessary to achieve this? What's holding us back? And the answers fall into these areas. Uh, <clears throat> And this is a case where I was last in Xi'an. Actually, it was done in Xi'an. And you can see over here the, the, the answers, and you can see the yin-yang there. And we're actually analyzing answers. They're being translated into English, and we're allocating it into this. For basically a Department of Finance for Shaanxi province. And these are the translated main constructs. And you can see that it was about bringing in good computer systems within uh, Chinese province. And you can see that the things that are logical, the, these are the generic terms, procedure, price, policy. These are summary in terms of the project. And these are statements. We've done many of those projects as part of analytics in UCD. Um, and here are the answers very simple method and what you do is you look and see well what does this mean you're taking individual answers and it turns out that 30 of them said we need better procedures for running our MIS systems and also we need to do it better in practice and also there needs to be a bit of leadership this was done for five counties the five counties in Shanxi province this was the one for Xi'an the other five the other four being done at the moment and some of them are more basic and that they're saying, we just need better computers. Uh, here is one that I did when the, from which I developed the ideas, which is uh, 1974, and it was to help solve the Dublin traffic problem. Now, what is interesting in all of this is the yin and yang. All you're looking for is the imbalance, and the biggest imbalance actually is in here. Um, nine people said we need to restructure the departments because you had three or four government departments all had something to do with transport, local government or environment and transport and uh, authority and justice and, and so on and only one person said yes but we, no, there's nobody there that can actually do the restructuring so how are, you going, how are you going to do that and actually out of that came the idea of reform of government departments and the Department of Economic Planning and Development because you needed an overview department to help do such a restructuring. So the problem there was that department was set up 
And then the Department of Finance said, we couldn't trust a department like that that isn't answerable to us. And they basically uh, spent two years wrecking it. And then when Charlie Howe got in 79, he wanted to do both himself, you know, run the finance and thesis. So he was very happy to, to get rid of it. And that's as far as it went. And uh, it would have been nice if Martin Dunn had been here because uh, he would give his own view on that. Um, this is one I did on the Irish economy, which was well received by the Taoiseach at the time and by others and essentially when you look at the content of the answers 45 of them said we need leadership to develop a consensus and those was the next biggest was we need a consensus and that was what was needed at the time, simple solutions um, <clears throat> so the difficulties we were running a bit short of time so maybe we could leave those to some of the questions and uh, <clears throat> The only person that's missing here that would have liked to have been here is Jim Long because we were trying to do this with Limerick and Shannon because China has an obsession with Shannon because they think this is where the gold at the end of the rainbow was. You know, this is where the magic is and they want a piece of that magic. The only thing is they don't realize that Shannon Svatko is one person and a secretary, whereas in China you're talking about industry parks with 10,000 people in it. Uh, so anyway, but it was blocked by just one official. Um, so coming to the end of this, where are things at the moment? The new president, well, you, he's over a year there now. His father is from Shanxi province. So that's his family. That's his plan. He has to do something for there. Um, the capital, Xi'an, you can see that in there, capital of Shanxi province, was actually for, for four or five dynasties was the capital of China. Mm. And it was the source of the Silk Road. So what are they doing now? The new policy is to develop a new economic belt Silk Road from China to Europe starting from there. And uh, this is it originally. The travels of Xinjiang. He went to India and then came back home. And uh, this is what they're keen on. This is the current situation. So we've had the good fortune. This is the lady that I work with on the right, Rong Du. And the guy in the middle is, uh, he would be a uh, deputy minister for Department of Science and Technology in Shanxi government. And we now have set up a project to help them with three parties, the, uh, us being the three parties. We got to visit the IDA. And you can see that the people that are in there, uh, particularly relevant, is the person I mentioned is there on the right, then vice president of the IDA, and a vice governor of Shanxi province. Quite, a, quite significant to have somebody at that level. <clears throat> Here, a presentation by people who are involved in research and production of chickens in Ireland to the delegation, received very well. And here is the meeting leading to the signing of the agreement in UCD. This is the current state of play. I would be delighted if there was interest in building on this and helping this because they are open to anything. Um, so, conclusions and way forward. Uh, there are a lot of problems. We, we need change. The IDA model is American model into Ireland. American money into Ireland is great. Are the Enterprise Ireland Irish companies trying to export? But if we we're going to do what China wants, which is that Ireland would become the commercialization hub for the West, you actually need to mix these two agencies together. A little bit of IDA, a little bit of Enterprise Ireland working together and building with, with a policy that we could become. I mean, we are so big in the US in, into Ireland, we could be so big for China into the rest of the world. Um, <clears throat> But there are issues to do with visas. Um, uh, we can't wait for the next program of government. <laughs> we must be doing something now. Um, new public management is a problem. Not just it's not just a problem with Ireland. It's Europe. It's the Western world. Uh, it has destroyed public service values in in Canada. It's being introduced currently in India. Um, and 
handing things on like that has created a government vacuum, which is, let's say we'll deal with it maybe when we're talking about it in the questions. So my point would be, and why I'm delighted to be here, is that I think there is a role for think tanks, such as the Institute for uh, International and European Affairs, to help maybe fill the vacuum, the policy vacuum. And that's it for a